It certainly is. And well, let's talk about the MotoGP that you were able to keep one eye on while you were up doing the Northwest. Um, Bagnaia on pole. Looked like he had the pace for the win, but a crash, a mistake, uh, lost the win, lost a podium for sure as well. Miller Bastianini making their way through. Quasararo, shocking start, but made his way back at the end. Just couldn't quite get past Alicia Spargo. He really gave him a fight to the line. Um, but it was it was a bit of an action-packed Le Mans with a bit of, bit of staleness in the middle, but then it got going towards the end. I was going to say, the start of Le Mans was absolutely frantic, wasn't it? It was mm. wings flying everywhere, everyone nudging everyone everywhere. I think the, the significance of Le Mans for me is, A, they got it away in the dry. I mean, to the detriment maybe of, of Moto3 and the, and the like. But they hit the target they needed to hit. It was dry. It was raising in temperature again. So the tyre issue comes into it. But significant was the three-time crasher, including in the warm-up, Bastianini. He just grew in stature through the entire race. He took it to everyone else. He forced Bagnaia into a mistake. Um, it's phenomenal at the moment what Bastianini is achieving on the on the older bike. We talked about it before we came on air. It might be an older bike. It might not be the factory bike. Excuse me just a second. Yes, I have a stinking cold to go with everything else as well. <laughs> Most will say I deserve for the state I'm in. <laughs> so, so please, no sympathy. Not that I was going to get any. Um, the, the, the fact was that Bastianini, you know, he rose in stature on... An older bike, perhaps, but I've always said this. The bloody um, oh, now my phone's going. <laughs> it's all happening today. It's because we changed the day. That's why it's because we're recording on a Tuesday, and it's all going off. You, you can't you can't beat a professional broadcaster working with. <laughs> <laughs> you must you must excuse me, folks. I'm doing my best, which isn't very <laughs> very high at the moment. Um, Bastianini you on an old bike. Um, it's got all the data. It's got all the, you know, they've been there. They've tried everything else. They've been up and down the scale of what should we do here at this racetrack. It's already in the system, already in the software, already in the in the notes. Um, and that makes a difference. Sometimes when you're there on a full factory bike that's been tweaked, you know, it is a full-on prototype that's, that might be slightly difficult to, to hit the sweet spot with. And I think that's what we see quite often. I mean, Jack Miller really went with a, a softer front tyre, which was seemed to work for him, whereas the others were, were on slightly harder tyres. Um, that didn't make a difference in the end. I think uh, Pastianini grew, like I say, in stature right the way through. I mean, three crashes, you would think. I mean, I've always said it. I think we said it when we were talking about the build-up. Le Mans is a crash fest. It is just carnage there. You know, you, each and every one of those corners is, 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 is difficult and you can fall down. And Bagnaia, despite the fact he's not really a crasher, yeah, you know, record them on is, is one of those corners, that double right hander. You can really dig in there normally. It's not a corner that, that you kind of slide off in the middle of it so much, although. But having said that, it was faster than it's ever been, Le Mans. I mean, like the overall race time was faster than it's ever been. It, it, the records were broken left, right, and center. So they, I think that MotoGP has got to the point where it is so precise, so fast, so accurate. Um, we can't see the mistakes. We can't feel the mistakes anymore like we used to be able to. You used to be able to see riders when they were slightly out of shape. Nowadays, the only time that, that, that we get any inkling that there's something not quite 100% is when they slide off the thing. It's a really strange feeling for me watching MotoGP now. It is, it's a remarkable series. It's, it, you know, they're all within you know, hundreds of a second of each other, whatever the manufacturer, whatever the, the style of chassis or, or, or motor. And it's just a series that you, oh, I'm going to get sworn out for this. It's gone a bit Formula One, you know, in that, in that it's, it's kind of, it's down to the bikes are so close. There's nothing they can do about it. And, you know, overtaking was a real problem at Le Mans. Now it, it never really used to be overtaking was, you know, quite easy at Le Mans, but now it seems to be, it's a problem. Aero is, is making a major difference. Um, so I don't know where we're quite going with this in conversation terms or in the in the series. It's a, it's a very tricky thing to get around and get over. Um, maybe we should start talking about the tyres. <laughs> God help. Well, before, before we do that, Pete, you know, what was your... You had a, a different view of the race as well. What did you make of it? Quite a costly mistake for Bagnaia in the end in what is a really crucial sort of time amongst the Ducati riders. 
it, it was, wasn't it? You know, he just got this win, had, had the bad start to the year. He'd won at, um, you know, Jerez really dominantly and looked looked great, back on form, looking to build momentum, as you, as you said in your introduction, Harry. Even if he didn't win the race, he was on course for a pretty pretty safe podium, even if he couldn't catch Bastianini. And then instead, you know, what is he, 46 points from the lead now? And and it's 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 a tricky situation we're seeing for Ducati. I mean, in a, of course, they love to see Bastianini on a Ducati up there, but you've got the three guys at the front, Quattararo, uh, Aleish and uh, Bastianini, and then there's a bit of a gap, isn't there, to uh, to the others. So, so the only guy at the moment in the fight is on last year's Ducati. Now, what do you do about that? Do you, do you start developing last year's Ducati, sending Piro out, the test rider, to maybe try and help Bastianini, or or do you rely on your factory guys, you know, getting that GP22 ahead in the second half of the season? Keith explained why last year's bike can be, you know, a better option. But I think we're, we're now, we've now had seven rounds. You know, we kind of expected the GP22 to sort of cross over and become the clear favourite bike, I guess, round now or before now. Instead, we're seeing three wins for Bastianini. No one else has won more than one race. I think it's, uh, you know, the, the, the beast is back again, isn't he? But I think I always, I, I keep juggling back and forth. What's the biggest shock of this year? Is it Bastianini or is it Aleish? You know, and it, and it keeps going, <laughs> you know, Aleish gets the win and now he gets the podiums and then Bastianini again. You know, both of them outstanding so far this year. Go on then. Let's uh, let's do the tyre situation then, Keith. Uh, I know we've spoken about it a, a little bit and, it, and then big news broke, I suppose. I say broken in inverted commas because, I mean, now, explain it, was, it to me, what Keith. It, it's, what, what's happening? Well, what it was was Matt Oxley managed to get hold of a sheet of paper that's readily available to everybody within the teams. And um, being a journalist, of course, this was this sensational piece that he put out that, that you know, everybody's cheating. Um, what it is, is it a gentleman's agreement, as it is at the moment, between all of the teams that they um, provide sheets to uh, Michelin. Michelin are working with all of the teams because there isn't quite the robust enough system for accurately and securely measuring the tire temperature tire pressures across all of the manufacturers um, the software is not quite there the, the protocol is not quite there it was supposed to be there this year but it didn't get signed off so um, 2023 uh, there will be this system in place where you know every millisecond of a, of, of a motorcycle's running uh, the information will be available to a race direction and, and they'll be able to see whether somebody has transgressed the rule. The rule has always been there, but I think what's happened is, is because there's not a robust enough, robust enough system behind it at the moment, nobody gets penalised. Um, now, I think the bigger question is, is why the bloody hell is that? You know, like we're on a prototype series here. Everybody knows that tyre pressures are a critical factor. Uh, Michelin give a, a, you know, a, a, lower than which you're not supposed to go tire pressure and yet there are people going below that that minimum tire pressure so straight away but so why don't they get a penalty because it can be manipulated at the moment it can still be manipulated up and down i mean these the, even the paperwork that oxley got his hands on could be manipulated it could be inaccurate so it's kind of one of these things it's a, it's a big story and it's a non-story as well it's one of these things that it seems sensational and everybody's jumped up and down all over it. Um, but the system isn't in place to accurately um, give the data um, without it being able to be manipulated in some way, shape or form. That's not to say that anybody is manipulating it, but it can be. And that's the you, you, you can't penalise people in a system that, that can be cheated if somebody so desires to do so. So... The big question is, why has it taken so long to get to where we're getting to for 2023? That would be my question. It's ridiculous. It, you know, when tyres and their tyre pressures are so critical to performance, um, this should have been in place forever ago. I mean, I ran Danny Aldridge and said, Dan, I thought we were already here, You know, like I'm sure you three, you two did. I, I mean, I, I thought we were already in a position where that was the case, like in Moto2, if you like. Um, but it's not. But it will be. But everybody... Everybody knew about this. This is not a secret. This is not a secret. In actual fact, from the paperwork that I've already seen, if um, if you took from that paper, there wouldn't be, I think there'd only be one or two um, teams that wouldn't have been penalised this year already for running low tyre pressures. Everyone would have had a penalty at some stage. Um, so it's something and nothing. And I think that, you know, it's kind of, it's a wonderfully sensational story for, for taking in, Slightly out of context, I always feel. 
in this situation. I think MotoGP's brought this on their sales a little bit. As Keith exactly. explained, by what, why didn't they make this public? Then at the start of the year, just say this is the situation, and then it would have been clear. I think you know Matt getting that that, that printout that was a great scoop. In fairness, I, I think anyone would have been pleased to get hold of that. But again, if it had been made clear. Uh, you know, at the start of the year, look, we're developing the system. There was a statement put out by Dorna, wasn't there, after this all broke, that, that explained why, uh, as you've explained then again, Keith, you know, why they're not being punished at the moment. But by keeping it quiet, it, it does give the uh, the impression that there's something going on, isn't there? Even though these sheets are available to all of the teams, as Banyaya said, 18 riders have been under. Now, you might say, why do people go under then? And the problem is that the tyre pressure changes, of course, during the race, doesn't it? And especially if you're behind another rider. Banyaya was under throughout the race at Jerez, but he was leading all the time. His teammate, Jack Miller, he passed the test. Now, they're on the same bike. Uh, so you've got to believe that probably, I mean, we don't know for sure, but they could well have had the same starting pressures. It's just that that Jack was in the pack. So he was, a, it's half the race, isn't it? You have to meet the, the limit. And, so he met the limit. The, that uh, is the problem, and, Pete. You've hit the nail on the head, Pete. It's a, it's a situation where, you know, they all start with pressures below um, what is supposedly legal, and they rely on the track temperature and the the pace that they're getting. You know, if you're if you're a second off the pace, your tire temperature is going to go down. If you're in the middle of the pack, your tire temperature is going to go right up. What difference does it make? Well, on the front end, you end up with it ballooning, so you end up with a with a with a lesser contact patch at the front end because the, the you know it's it's kind of the, temp the the pressure has gone up to such an extent where the tire doesn't flex doesn't squidge into the into the tarmac like it should do it's tiny but it's critical at this level when we are when we're looking at three decimal points for a you know qualifying situation sometimes that, that makes the difference when you've got a second that covers 24 bikes sometimes you know it's crazy close at the moment so you know cheating is what it could be said it is but I like to think it's more up, excuse me a minute. <laughs> I cannot believe that I'm actually sitting here. Got, I do, I do apologise to folks that are listening to this. I've got a stinking cold and I've got a throat like it feels like a raft. I was going to say, apologise to the people watching this. It, will, um, it's the people we'll watching it, it that can anyway. see you. The listeners won't know that you're wiping your nose. Uh... No, I know. Um, yeah, but I do apologise. But, um, you know, tyre pressures, I don't quite know where they're going to go with this, um, you know, because they give an option. If they say that you, I think that you need to be able to say that you're starting at the minimum point. I don't think there should be any leeway in that. I think if it's 1.9 bar or whatever it is, it's 1.9 bar. And if you've not started at that point, then you're illegal and you get penalised. I think if you allow them to be under at the start of a race, um, then in that case, you, you, leave, you leave it almost for the point if the rider isn't performing or if he or if there's a cloud comes over the track, or if something changes, or if he's in fresh air, um, he's going to be under for longer than the 50%. Um, so it is, it's, a, it's, it's almost, you know, you've got, to, you've got to have a crystal ball for tyres, haven't you? You've got to be able to work out where it's going to go, where it's likely to go. But if you if you make it that <clears throat> the minimum uh, tyre tire pressure is this at the start of a race, so when you go to the grid, you know, if you're under, you get penalised. The... the I mean, that seems the obvious thing, doesn't it? Just just check it before the race. Of course, what you could then do is you can make the tyres even hotter in the tyre warmers so that they're a bit, you know, so that they drop more once the tyre warmers come out. And, and as you say, Keith, you know, what's the time between taking the tyres out the tyre warmer and putting the gauge on? You know, everything would have to be sort of standardised because it will change so much. You know, it might be legal when, they, when, they, when it's in the tyre warmers and then it drops down on the grid. It would depend, are you the first bike they check on the grid? Have you been standing on the grid for a few minutes so the, the temperature and pressure has gone down a bit? It, it, well, yeah, the thing it's is, amazing it, that there isn't something in place, isn't there? That's, it will that's be in it. real time. The measurements will be in real time. So all of the grid will be checked at the same time. You know, it's not like there will be separate or incremental, the guy who gets his pressure. It's not like going up there with one of them bloody pressure gauges and then push, put it on the, on the valve. <laughs> Um, it'll all be done, you know, through through data, and uh, and and that I think that's the difficulty. That is the difficulty they're up against. All the things that you've just said and above. It's a it's a nightmare scenario, really, to try and get that standardised and measured in a way that that doesn't penalise someone somewhere unnecessarily. Tricky, isn't it? I, 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 how could it how could it be so bloody difficult putting air in a tyre? <laughs> 
I think you should go out and do it for the next Grand Prix, and uh, and you should be in charge of it. Oh, I think Keith. They don't want any hot air. Yeah. They only want cool air. <laughs> yeah. Keith, I'd like to. Sit. You could kick the you could kick the tires on the grid, Keith, and just you know, yeah, yeah, looks yeah that'd be all right. Yeah. <laughs> Keith, Keith Hewitt in a management position at Dorna is what I would like to see. I think that would really start to season changes. That'd be delightful. I'll tell you what, Dorna, Dorna, and the technical department at Erta are very smart people. If they've not put this in place, there's a reason for that. Mm. It's yeah, we're talking about the MSMA, some of the smartest brains there are, and just the, the complexity of it. I mean, Pete, you've touched on it, you know, and I'm sure that's just the surface of it. There, there have got to be a lot of reasons why this hasn't happened already. And, you know, some of the smartest brains in the world are working their way around it on how they can implement something that can't be tampered with, that can't be falsified, that is secure, and that also doesn't penalise everybody unnecessarily because of other factors that's that's the issue you've just said it you know you're running tire warmers at two or three degrees higher than than the next man and your tire pressure will be legal at the time you whip them off and um, go to the grid you know it's it's a similar situation to they they measure the temperature of fuel you know at the end of the day you you freeze fuel fuel you know, cold fuel going through a motor will perform and it also is, is less at incapacity. So if you've got a situation where you are, you know, you're, you're close to, to, to capacity, uh, you know, race distance wise, then cold fuel counts. Um, they seem to have got over that all right. Although, you know, I have seen incidences where cold fuel have, have picked up a penalty and now we've got the same thing. There's got to be scientists out there other than, you know, we're bloody useless at it, aren't we, at the end of the day? We're just the... Again, it's something right off the back of it. It's 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 just so complex for something so simple. But isn't that always the case? Simple stuff is complex. Always is. It's uh, not quite rocket science or brain surgery, but it's uh, still pretty complex, I think. So MotoGP continues uh, to roll on. I think 